Hi, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Please, sir, can you please introduce yourself? I'm simply Oba Dokun Thompson. I'm the Ohlone of Etioni in Ocean State, Nigeria. I am also the founder of the International Cocoa Diplomacy, which is a not-for-profit organization registered in the UK. Okay, sir. So please, can you tell us about what you do to accompany the chocolate um, site? I am the custodian of the oldest cocoa plantation in Nigeria. And when I became an Oba in 2008, one of the things that I needed to do was to see how we could work to harness our resources in terms of human, our land, and even natural resources, which is basically cocoa, and um, look for ways of harnessing these resources to transform our community, which is basically rural. And most times when we look at rural communities in Africa, they go line in line with poverty. So how do we change that? The only way we can change that is to begin to define for the purpose of value creation, wealth creation. And the only way we can also do that is to have a good understanding of what we have in our hands. And for us, it is cocoa which led to creating a cocoa festival in Ocean State to begin to recognize the farmers, their work, appreciate them, and look for ways of having this renewal of a mindset around their... Because a lot of the farmers are old, averagely 50 years. And the children, the next generation of farmers, don't want to have anything to do with cocoa. So how do we create sustainability while transforming our community? So you have to look for ways of returning a farmer's self-worth, dignity, and pride. That is what has led into the international cocoa diplomacy. So what we're doing is to create a culture, a culture of value that's people can begin to understand and appreciate raw materials as they are, and also understand the value that can be extracted from what we call raw materials. If you're not participating in the entire full value chain, then you'll be losing a lot. So that is what my work is all about, trying to bridge the gap between what we call producing and consuming the value of any product is in its consumption. So we're looking at ways of bridging that gap, which leads into creating platforms whereby we can exchange ideas with those who know. We can begin to also exchange um, culture, provide opportunities for networking, partnerships, collaboration. So that's the simplest or the easiest way I can describe it for now and um, I'll probably be able to go into more details as this progresses. Please, sir, um, you recently um, did a partnership with a company. I think it's a UK firm that was in March. Can you tell, give us details about that partnership, of the purpose of that partnership? We have a challenge in Nigeria, in Africa, when it comes to raw materials. We see our raw materials as finished products. That's why we cannot extract the full value. So what we did, actually met the company after they heard me speak at uh, the London Chocolate Forum in 2018. They came to meet me and said, you have a beautiful story, you have an interesting one. Can we partner with you to come up with something? And over the years, we started coming up with different kinds of models till we reached a workable one and came up with the Gurije 4 chocolate. My great-grandfather is Gurije 1. He was the one that started cocoa production in 1896 in Etioni. So I'm Gurije 4. And that's the reason for having that chocolate brand as Gurije 4. It's basically a luxury chocolate brand, which 
is finished in the UK. The process starts from Nigeria. We produce, we process to semi-finished products and then go into the UK or to Europe to finish it into chocolate and mold into chocolate bars. This is only the beginning of it. Then we're going to move into different chocolate products. We have the pralines, we have the bonbons, you have the truffles and different kinds of chocolate finished products that the market would appreciate, not just because it's delicious, but because there's an ethical, a very, very strong ethical component behind it. The proceeds from the chocolate is fully brought back to Nigeria to begin to work to transform our community. So which is actually the main objective. It's about transformation. It's not about an individual. It's not about me or the farmer. But it's about the entire community. Please, can you give us the three largest markets for your chocolate and an estimate of the revenue? It's just started. We've gone into a very highly developed market. That's in the UK, the UK market. The UK market is about two, three billion pounds for chocolate. And um, we're also looking at Japan, which has a f about $4 billion market share. We're looking at South Korea, we're also looking at Europe, and then North America, Canada, the US, to start, or, I mean, to move into over the next few years. But um, when we now do that, we're now going to do a reverse back into Nigeria to see how we can capture the market in Nigeria and Africa based on the Africa continental free trade area, which provides a market share of what? Well, or a market size of 1.4 billion people. But that's really not the main proposition or, you know, value proposition, because if they don't understand it, even though it may be a huge market size, but it may not offer the value proposition we want and um, where the best way to work around things is to look at uh, how much do we think we can produce in terms of cocoa and in terms of conversion into chocolate so if we look at an output size of let's say 5,000 tons of cocoa and we're able to convert that into chocolate, into this market I'm talking about, then we're looking at uh, we're looking at about five hundred million pounds yeah. in a year. Yes, um, revenue easily by the time we can um, fully exploit our plans. But you see, Nigeria as a country produces 300,000 tons, mm -hmm. tops on the average, mm -hmm. and earn less than a billion dollars in cocoa. Ivory Coast, Ghana, Cameroon, we're looking at 75% of the total global output of cocoa. We've an annual income of less than $10 billion. Mm. But this is a market value, industry value of about $200 billion. Mm. So they're only making, they're able to make only about what? You know, it's about one to 20, mm -hmm. really. So, and that's what I am trying to change, mm -hmm. to see how it's not about um, sharing that 200 billion dollars because there's still other markets mm -hmm. even though they're not fully mm -hmm. you have china you have asia mm -hmm. india you have um, the middle east that's mm -hmm. still been developed and of course you have africa so we can increase the market's uh, size mm -hmm. and then share the value with those who are already in currently in the markets mm -hmm. the players within the markets yeah we have a few um, craft chocolate makers in Nigeria, you know, the artisanal, artisan chocolate makers. 
the value of artisan or craft chocolate makers, when we look at the global value, is only about 1% of the entire um, cocoa value worth. But the those that, and we're talking about 7,000 different individual small companies or more. But when we're talking about the major independent or big players, we're not, we're talking about only about 100, so about 100 organizations or less share 99 percent and about seven thousand small organizations share one percent so and that's why the market needs a lot of understanding mm. to see how it can be fully exploited and the only way you can achieve it which is what led to us moving on to create the grade j4 chocolate is collaboration and partnership to be able to have a full view of the value chain because um, the biggest challenge for Nigerian cocoa processing is the market. Mm. You have installed capacity of about 150 to 200,000 metric tons, mm. but you're doing less than 25 to 30 percent of that mm. because you don't, if you provide um, even 70, 80 percent in terms of um, finished products. I'm sorry, semi-finished products mm -hmm. or semi-products, industrial products, mm -hmm. cocoa butter, liquor, mm -hmm. powder. Mm -hmm. You may not find market for it mm -hmm. because um, that understanding is still not there. And there's so many infrastructure that is also left as out. We don't have those facilities. In Africa, you cannot even, we don't even have um, a facility to pasteurize milk, which keeps or increases the shelf life of any milk product by a year. So we don't, there's a lot of problems. So it's, um, it's a lot of work as well. And it needs uh, requires a lot of dedication. Okay, so you've talked about a lot of challenges for Nigeria in terms of gap and revenue. What do you think can actually be done to actually, you know, um, solve these challenges and you know be able to even increase our production and value and be like maybe the coast of the countries like Ivory Coast and because these countries are actually smaller economies and Nigeria is a giant of Africa. When we founded the International Cocoa Diplomacy, it was to address issues like this, is to create awareness and um, teach people how to make the best of what they have. In January, we had the International Cocoa and Chocolate Forum, which was chaired by the Minister of Finance and the co Coordinating Minister of the Economy. We had several speakers, the uh, Minister for Budget and Planning, but most interestingly, we had the chief trade negotiator of um, Nigeria. And from the communique, we sent a proposal to, to them, to, to that office. That's the Nigeria Office for Trade Negotiations, to see how we can begin a trade dialogue series. Mm -hmm. The trade dialogue series will begin to explain what trade is about. Because currently, Nigeria does not practice trade in the sense of trade, international trade. What we do is we practice trade based on domestic consumption. So the trade infrastructure, the trade systems is, was actually um, created to address importation of several things or to stop it. Right, not to actually see how you can exploit trade in the in terms of exports, because then Nigeria would be more into how to ensure there is collaboration, partnerships, and that's what Europe or North America has been able to do with so many things in terms of cocoa or chocolate or any other product. So 
you provide the machinery, I provide certain raw materials, some people provide the expertise, you know, from different countries. And um, at the end of the day, you create one product, and then that value, you look for ways of sharing into it. That's how trade works, international trade. And then you can be looking at a market size that is four, five times, or even 10 times bigger than your market. Let's look at China, for instance. China has a population of about, what, 1.4, 1.5 billion people. But China is always looking for new markets. So when people say, oh, the Nigerian market is big enough, now you understand where they're coming from. It's for domestic consumption. But where you want a market-driven economy, you are going to be looking for market size. Nigeria is what? Over 200 million people. So Nigeria should be looking for market size that is about 1.5, 1.8 billion people beyond Africa, you know, and where the value is really located. Because mm -hmm. uh, there, there's so much gap in policy, so much gaps in implementation, so much gaps in infrastructure, so much gaps in even the understanding, you know, the technical know-how, the market intelligence, our statistics, data. We have to rely on foreign organizations, international bodies to provide us with even our own population projections to be able to drop a development plan. Mm -hmm. Development plans are usually done over 30, 40, 50 years. They're the ones telling us what we should expect our population should be in 70 years. We don't even know what our population should be in the next five, 10 years. So you, you see the gaps and all this must be put into consideration and addressed. I remember last year I was at an event where um, it's actually a food and beverage event. I actually met a local um, cocoa producer and she told me something that the high cost of certain FX, even before we had the FX reform last year, that it actually boosted the demand for her products, right? I see more demand for chocolates. So, and I know that in that market, we don't have enough of local producers of chocolates, right? We've, we've talked about the challenges in terms of you know export and only the um, chocolate market do you see more local um, chocolate makers springing up in nigeria let me quickly <laughs> break down something for you to okay. tell you how difficult it is over the last five months coco has risen from three thousand yeah. or more uh, well just below three thousand naira per kilogram to it went up to 13,000 recently yeah. per kilogram. If you want to do a 70% chocolate bar, you will get about, um, if it's 80 gram per bar, you get, let's say about maybe 16 to 17, or even by the time you add some sugar, let's say 20 bars of chocolate. That's, and you sold each one for 1,000 Naira. Mm -hmm. That's 20,000 Naira mm -hmm. in one kilogram or from one kilogram of cocoa. Mind you, the primary product is 13,000. So you have 7,000 Naira to play around with sugar, cost of sugar, cost of power, yeah. cost of labor. Yeah. You can see how impossible it is and you would not even have any margins in that. The maximum output or the maximum capacity, that's manufacturing of chocolate in Nigeria, because they're all craft chocolate makers. Mm -hmm. It's not up to 300 tons, maybe 100. You have one doing maybe 12. You have Others doing like two, three, one. You know, so if I want to be generous, I'll say they're doing, we have a capacity of doing up to 100 tons of chocolate mm -hmm. 
if you divide that and get the ratio in terms of the production output, mm -hmm. Nigeria, which is 300,000, mm -hmm. you see that we're doing less than 0 0.001. The way it is right now, it needs a lot of funding. You cannot be a craft chocolate maker and be able to scale up. It's not possible. And before you are able to scale up, you're going to need a lot of funding. You also need a lot of awareness. And that's what we call creating the cocoa culture, okay. which is... Um, a culture of consumption, a culture of appreciation. Okay. Yes, to a certain extent, we have uh, people giving out chocolates on Valentine's mm -hmm. Day, birthdays, yeah. but it's not enough. Uh, in a place like uh, France, they even use chocolate to drink coffee in a small piece of chocolate. So, you know, those are little, little ways, of, um, and it's been entrenched over the last two, three hundred mm -hmm. years. It is not just about importation because the price of, um, you know, the rates of the foreign exchange has gone up, that someone has um, patronage. It's not just about that. Mm -hmm. To a great extent, it's about this emotional and sentimental attachment that, oh, okay, a Nigerian is finally making chocolate. Yes, we can capitalize on that, but... Are the people willing to pay that 3,000 Naira or 4,000 Naira yes. for a bar of chocolate? That is, it's almost impossible. I have um, a bar, a Greek for bar here, just so that you have an idea of what we're talking about. You see, there is, um, there is the challenge when you come, when it comes to, some people ask the question, why don't you manufacture here and export? Yes. And I'll tell you, you don't have milk. You don't have sugar. When you have milk and sugar, it is not consistent. And we're talking about people with highly developed taste or culture. So once there's that inconsistency, you know, you lose them because the, their chocolate culture is very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. They know what they're trying to get from um, eating chocolate mm -hmm. or even serving chocolates. And they have a lot of events, you know, wine pairing with chocolate, doing this and that with chocolate. And right, even though they don't um, even grow cocoa, the children in the primary school know more about cocoa in the UK, in Europe, or in America. They know more about cocoa than a Nigerian. We see it as um, local, as non-beneficial, but they see it as something that they must know, mm. that they must appreciate. Mm. Because um, most times people think that is coming from just a factory. But it's actually a plant. <laughs> That's the truth. It's, it's just a plant. It's not nothing more, you know. So, I mean, when you now talk about um, the dairy side of it, the sugar side of it, what about the packaging? When we talk about the packaging and it's okay, what about the ink around the packaging? Because, you, you know, everything, if you're looking at um, the developed world or economies, they're talking about health situations, they're talking about safety, they're talking about so many things. So the ink on the packaging must be food grade. Yeah. Chocolate is a very sensitive product. So if it smells at all, the chocolate is going to pick up that um, smell and it's going to be part of what will make it up in terms of um, the taste and what you're going to perceive from it. So chocolate itself is, um, is very, very sensitive 
very, very delicate and you have to treat it with that sort of, um, in that manner. Then how do you get things out of Nigeria? If you want to export perishable goods from Ghana, you're sure that within 48 to 72 hours, it's leaving the shore. When you get it to the port, it's leaving the shore. If you try that here, in fact, this is the way I say, I say you need fasting and prayer. <laughs> and that should that be the case? You need fasting and prayer to get your goods out of the pots here. And that shouldn't be the case. We should be able to get our goods out of the country within 48 to 72 hours. You see people, logistics companies telling you, oh yes, we bring things into the country. Tell them, sorry, I want to take things out. No, 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 we don't do it. Because of the bottlenecks, the bureaucracies, the madness, and every single type of um, problems and toll gates and barriers that is, you know, the chaotic environment that has been created to either create, put money into some individual's pockets. Yes, we have the Office of the Ease of Doing Business, and I hope that they're going to be more active in trying to... It's not just about how easy it is to register a business or how easy it is to open an account mm -hmm. or receive, but how easy is it to move goods around the roads, the rail? When we're looking at AFTA, I can't even move anything from Nigeria to Ivory Coast by sea. Mm -hmm. We don't have a sea route along the west coast of Africa. So I'd have to first of all fly it into Europe mm -hmm. or ship it to Europe mm -hmm. before I get. So you see, so this, uh, is, there's a major problem. Mm -hmm. And it's the problems that we can resolve. Mm -hmm. If they're not, um, yeah, you know, they're, they're not problems that are insurmountable. They, they are there and they are man-made problems. So it's either by action or inaction. So just put the right things in place and um, you see how everything works. Sir, so you've actually talked about the many challenges that the cocoa industry faces in Nigeria. So now, what role do you think the government can actually play in terms of boosting local production? Because right now we've all cried that one of the ways that can actually boost FX increases mm. exports, right? Especially non-oil exports. So what role do you think the government and the private sector can actually play here? And if whatever... Um, whatever things are set to actually improve local production, what opportunities lies ahead for Nigeria? Because you've actually said a lot of things, and from what I'm hearing, a lot of challenges. So what can be done? Let's work from the back, back you know, in, in, in short. Let's talk about the opportunities, yeah. the potentials, and then, because that's the easiest way. Number one, the opportunity, we have the potential of fast-tracking our economy to reach a trillion dollars easily a year. That's the potential. The opportunities now creates a lot of jobs, starts developing and transforming um, our communities. The largest chunk of Nigeria's wealth is in the rural community. The government is very particular about food security at the moment. So obviously, we, there, there's a lot of um, potentials and opportunities in that area. And um, the only way we can do anything is to ensure farmers, the rural communities, are, have the right incentives. I always say, make a statement that farmers are not poor. What makes them poor is their living conditions, right? So when a farmer has a dollar in his pocket, he can be rich. And when he has a thousand dollars in his pocket, he can be poor. Because when you don't have access to roads to move goods and services out, 
you don't have the right um, education for your children for the children will lack in social services lack in decent um, housing and so many things like that so, but we know we cannot do everything at the same time mm -hmm. but we can begin to build mm -hmm. banking in Nigeria that's supposed to be the right partner because when we're now talking about private sector a lot of these things go hand in hand funding Nigeria is the only place I see banking practice the way it is practiced only recently I think it was Vietnam uh, a bank owner was sentenced to death for moving funds in her bank into private company for real estate development. That is a normal practice in Nigeria, and that shouldn't be the case. Government gives you, creates opportunities, access to credit at about, you know, single digits yeah. figures. And by the time it gets into the hands of the commercial banks, to disburse, mm -hmm. charge you 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 1 point this, you know, different kinds of charges. Before you know what's happening, you have um, 25, 30, 40% interest rates or whatever, some crazy figure. So our banks that should be partners, should be working partner with the government are not doing what they're supposed to do and the government needs to change that. I'm happy that um, the, their share capital has been increased. Some of them have been increased mm -hmm. to 500 billion. Mm -hmm. At least it will create um, mm -hmm. some avenue for the government to raise some funds. Mm -hmm. It will also create avenue for, but it's not a case of them mm -hmm. now passing it mm -hmm. on to those account holders. There has to be a way that proper banking, we must return to traditional banking. We must return to partnership developmental banking. Mm -hmm. Banking should be done properly, mm -hmm. not the way it is being done. Mm -hmm. Once that is fine-tuned, the private sector is doing everything it can. Mm -hmm. But without the funds, there's nothing they can do. Government, when we did um, our the International Cocoa and Chocolate Forum, when we had it in January, mm -hmm. the Minister for Budget and National Planning made a statement. He said it was very important that we re-engineer our policies mm -hmm. in a way that we will be able to com um, compete with the development, the developed economies or developing economies, because there's a lot of contention once you live here. And our economy can never really grow without thinking of outside of these so called comfort, I want to call it comfort zone. I'm talking about Nigeria, the local or domestic market. We need to be able to move out there. And when we are moving out there, there's going to be. Um, penalty for lack of corporate governance. You won't even be able to operate in those um, economies because of the way they're structured. There's accountability, there's transparency. It is the order of the day. And that's why we see these countries or these economies advancing beyond what we are doing here. We currently working as and being happy as a big fish in a very small pond. But I say that you're better off as a small fish in a large pond if you have the constant flow. And um, that's why I said, let me speak from the potentials, speak about the opportunities. And while speaking about the opportunities, I'm also trying to tell you about the challenges and how we can resolve them. And um, It's a renewed hope for us all. And I think um, we're on course. But we need to do more in terms of trade. Security is another problem. It's a major issue in certain areas where 
um, farmers are displaced, uh, those who should be working and also producing are locked up in some displaced camp, you know, internally displaced um, people. So that should not be the case. So again, um, a, a huge percentage of the workforce, I'm talking about the farming community, is also locked in into um, a sorry case. And um, security, food production, a thriving economy, they all go hand in hand. And of course, transparency and um, well-structured and accountable corporate governance is very, very important. And I will not, everybody is always ready to blame the public sector. I think the private sector is doing worse. Uh, yeah, the private sector is doing worse. And the banking industry is worse than any public sector as far as I'm concerned. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I really enjoyed the conversation. You've actually broadened my knowledge when it comes to chocolate uh, making at the industry in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you.